Welcome to another episode of the Tough Stuff Podcast. Be sure to like, love, share, or subscribe wherever you may be watching or listening because we believe God wants to bring encouragement and hope to people through these stories. What's up, guys? Hey, Tough hey, Stuff hey. Podcast. Here we are. Again. Episode five. five. Can't believe it crazy past five weeks have been awesome yeah i was gonna ask you what do you think about the last five or four episodes uh it's been fun it's been fun to really it's get kind to, of been like a roller coaster it has been <laughs> but my biggest joy has just been getting it to work with you and something oh, together wow. you know it's like we had you know our beginning of our stories and then we brought Brienne on and told that powerful story of Mila, and, and then, then we, we brought, brought Zach. Zachary. <laughs> There's nobody uh, like him. Nobody. Was so fun. I had so much like fun doing him. that. And I think about it every day, just how fun that was. But today has been something. It something. has been trying to trying to make this happen. Uh, clock is ticking. We just put our two year old down for a nap. She's not two. About to be two. She will be two. And she's pretty much two. She acts like she's two. <laughs> she's in the terrible twos. We've been trying to put her down for a nap for about the past hour. I think so. she's on to us. I think she's, she knows what we're doing. She's finally quiet, so we're going to jump into this thing. And Man, we're excited about today. Uh, something we've been, really was on our hearts since the very beginning of starting this podcast and mm-hmm. getting this thing going and just really sharing our story. Yes. So our story. We shared my story, shared your story. And here we're, we are with our story. Our story. Um, which is probably, I don't know. I don't even know where to start. Yeah. Well, you know, I think it'd be funny, not funny, but awesome, if we started with um, how we met. Yeah. You know? It's how we met. Well, let's do this. How about you share your version of how we met and then I'll share mine my perspective was <laughs> I was whatever you say dating but you're like in like middle school so you're not really dating you're just mm-hmm. passing letters to some girl uh with some private school girl uh and who was one of my friends at the time which I didn't know well I guess I did know because searching through Maybe MySpace at that yeah, time. Yeah, we were MySpacing. Make, searching through MySpace, started looking at some of her uh, friends. and. Let me just say, I was at a sleepover at her house when she told me that she was dating this new guy, Crispy. And she showed me a picture of you, and I remember thinking... Oh man, like he's really cute, but he looks really bad. <laughs> <laughs> so we, I think we were MySpace friends, we were and MySpace. maybe rolled into Facebook friends. You were never at in some my top point. eight, though. No, we, I, we didn't even <laughs> met. I think I seen you. I remember seeing you one time at a movie theater, and I think some of our friends had went and talked to because our friend, my friends, were friends with your friends, and our friend groups kind of crossed over. And I remember just seeing you from the other side of probably Tinseltown. Tinseltown. And I was like, she's a little too tall for me. A little too tall. We (laughs) are exactly the same height. And then uh, from there, I remember meeting you on Bourbon Street. Bourbon Street. Well, let me just say this. We had the same group of friends, but at different times. So it's like um, we were never friends with them at the same time. Mm-hmm. So I never really hung out with you. Never had a party together. Never had a party Nothing together. Like that. But crazy. we knew of each other for years and years, probably since I was in eighth grade. And you were a little older, so mm-hmm. you were however old you were. Um, but I remember we had like all the same friends. So we knew of each other. And honestly, you were the guy that when I got to the end of high school, early college, you were the guy in my friend group that we would call, or we did call, to get <laughs> marijuana on Bourbon Street, which, you know, thank God that we're in a different season now. Which is really funny <laughs> because you're on a podcast and you feel like you've got to use, like, proper terms, marijuana. Marijuana. <laughs> yeah, you were my connect that day. But that um, was the first time I think we ever actually saw each other. Yes, this was oh. all before... You know our current season of life in our in the church and connected in that way. We were both uh, just living our life in a very <laughs> free way, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess what fast forward a few years, 
We yeah, not God long after that, in both of our lives. Yeah, God intervened in both of our lives, probably within a couple of months of each other. Mm-hmm. Um, so you had your moment with Him, um, where you were in rehab and God healed you, and um, and then I think a couple months later is when I had my moment with Him, yeah. and and God changed my life, and then we both found ourselves. I guess back at the ch- well, not back at the church. I was not in the church. I was at a different church. But you were. We both landed back at Healing Place for school. For school, we we, both we decided registered for school. But I think before then Uh-oh. is when you hit me up on Facebook mm-hmm. on the Facebook on, Facebook. on hit me up on Facebook. Is that back when you had to have like a college email in order to have a Facebook? I don't know. I've never had a college email, uh, maybe, so I guess maybe not. it wasn't. <laughs> Uh, but you hit me on Facebook trying to hear my testimony. Wanted to hear your testimony because you were so you were just bad dude. I had to know. <laughs> so then, fast forward to that, we end up in school together, same class, which is so crazy. Just to see how God just brings things around full circle, and you know, and even all through school, you know, I was like, I remember seeing you. I remember we we kind of kind of engaged with each other. And then I remember seeing you across the sanctuary again one Sunday or one Wednesday night or something. I was like, yeah, she's still too tall. <laughs> and then we started school together. And, uh, and then you were like, we're the same height. <laughs> <laughs> but then I think about how we just started going to school together. And, you know, what really attracted me to you was we had a lot of great people in our class. But really just the way that I felt like your heart was for Jesus in a more mature way. I felt like I, I guess I was a little bit older than some of the kids in our school too, because they were, some of them were straight out of high school and whatnot. And I was just at a place where I was like, man, this is all I got. Mm -hmm. Like, I got to take this thing serious. Yeah. Well, I feel like we both had just had this miraculous independent moment with Jesus, each of us, Mm -hmm. where he changed our life and we knew the power of God. And most people around us at that time probably didn't have the same yeah, for sure. recent history yeah. of, you know, God doing such a miracle in both of our lives. So I think when I look back at that time, I think we were like at the same level, at the same pace. Mm-hmm. Like God God same was, hunger. Yeah, the same we, God was doing a lot in both of yeah. us and we kind of saw eye to eye. And while some of our classmates were like, I'm going to be a missionary to Africa. I've been wanting to do this in second grade. And I was like, I'm just trying to like not have anxiety <laughs> and just like be a good person. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember we started, I don't remember how, I guess we started hanging out and it was so funny. Remember we played basketball together after school, which is hilarious in yeah. itself. I was, I'm so but competitive. Loving basketball is how we got loving started. Basketball. Started playing some basketball and hanging out. And I guess we eventually kind of segued into, into dating a little bit. Mm-hmm. And then uh, I realized that I felt like God told me that you weren't supposed to be dating in that season. Because if you remember in episode two, I said, I don't need to be dating nobody. Uh-huh. Well, you caught my eye, and so I was like willing. I was willing to compromise, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Until God said no. But then I realized you can't compromise with God. Yeah. <laughs> like God will not let you compromise. <laughs> and we put that on hold for a little while. We went to school for six months together mm-hmm. without even talking because we felt like God told us to lay hey, it down. We need to be separated. We need to not be dating. Not mm-hmm. be pulling from each other, leaning on each well, other in this season. Me specifically, I mean, in with my past, that was my next thing. It's like relationships were my go-to. So mm-hmm. that was like my next drug. Like God God knew that I needed to like stop what I was yeah. doing. And so um, it was only fitting that you, like dating somebody new would be my next move. No, for sure. But I love that God caught me by telling you that I needed space and time. And so, um, I remember calling you and be like, did you like make a promise to God to be single or something? And I was like, what do you mean? (laughs) (laughs) So crazy. Just how God's faithfulness, you know, he's even faithful when we're not trying to be faithful. Cause it's not like we want, like, it's like everything in me would love, love to date you, but you were right. You know, God, that was what God had asked. Yeah. So we laid it down six months in class together. Didn't talk, didn't hang out, really. We kind of looked, kinda at, each looked other. at each other. That's exactly <laughs> what I was about to say. Like, I just remember us in the concourse playing, like, 
I don't know, dodgeball or whatever we used to play in between classes, mm-hmm. kind of catching eyes here and there or whatnot. But in fast but forward But we were to, like very big rule followers about that. I feel like you're not really that great of a rule follower. <laughs> I'm surprised that you did that. Yo, you being a rule follower, I'm sure helped a good bit. <laughs> and fast forward, we started dating. And then uh, I think one of the most significant things for me in our story is really our engagement story. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I'm fast forward and jumping too no. far ahead for you. But I remember just, you know, I think I'd gone to Christmas with your uh, at your dad's house and kind of had met them a few times here and there and this is this kid at this time i think i've got dreadlocks uh i don't know if i still had earrings and nose rings and all this or you already told me you didn't like those things yeah i think that was after i told (laughs) you i was not a fan Uh, which took you about six months for you to build up the curse (laughs) by the way i don't really like your earrings i'm not really into those earrings or like the nose ring either or like the ones on your inside yeah you can take those out i wouldn't really mind (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> anyway, I meet your parents and stuff, and we're just, like, still dating. And at that point, you know, I do think we were blessed that we, man, we had a understanding of dating was for marriage. Mm-hmm. So when we started dating, we knew it was serious. We knew what we wanted. And at that point, I felt like God had kind of spoken to me about maybe possibly proposing to you. And here I, we're both in Bible school. Broke. Broke. <laughs> Don't have anything to our name. And I'm like, how would I ever ask this private school girl's white dad to... <laughs> Why does he have to be white? <laughs> white uh, engineer dad, uh-huh. just to kind of give you a little more context. You're, you're just sharing how opposite you are. Yes, yeah, from, big time. Yeah. How would I ever ask him for his daughter's hand in marriage? And I think it was maybe that day we went to school. We were in class or at the beginning of our little chapel or whatever. And I remember looking down at your phone, and it was your dad texted you and said, hey, tell Chris I want to get lunch with him. And I was like, it was one of those, like, (laughs) caught dead, cold, like, scared me type deals. (laughs) Like, oh, this is really happening. Not even on my go, but it's really happening. And then from there, you know, I remember me and your dad went to... (laughs) <laughs> not to bring the white thing up again but we went to tj ribs and there was peanuts in the coleslaw and that's what i thought was so <laughs> odd <laughs> i'd never been to tj ribs like peanuts in the coleslaw and then i remember him just looking at me and i think it was one of the first things we even said at lunch with each other and he said i want you to let you know you have full permission to marry my daughter which is crazy to you because you didn't even have to ask I didn't ask you didn't ask, and you was just ready to ship you off. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> Please, somebody marry this girl. No, <laughs> but you know, I, I think about your story, where you came from, and you know, even some things that you maybe haven't shared on this podcast about girls that you dated, mm. and just um, because of your past, you were not really looked upon as a like stand-up guy. Yeah, it was exceptional. I've had. In church and out of church. I mean, I've had girls' fathers threaten to take their housing from them. I've had a girl buy, dad buy me a car one time to quit dating his daughter. <laughs> That's extreme. So it was very extreme. You know, I had a lot of, I had a lot of church hurt, you know, being new in the church and, you know, people really not knowing where I was coming from, if this was really going to be a thing that stuck for me. You know, for your dad to give me that permission was just, it was huge. It was huge for me. And then I remember getting home that afternoon from school, and I walk in my mom's room, in the, our living room. I was living at my mom's at that time. And there was a couple Ziploc bags with diamond rings and diamonds sitting on the counter, which was also a very odd also thing. Also strange. <laughs> very odd thing. So I remember my mom coming home and be like, Mom, why you got uh, these rings sitting on the counter? You know, And at this point, it's like, all right, God, I know you're up to something. And she was like, you know, we went to your, I guess it would be my great aunt, if that's even like a thing. It was my mom's aunt. Is that? All right. We went to, she was like, oh, we cleaned out her house, you know, after she passed. And we thought we'd gotten everything out. But then we found these in a drawer today. And I was like, oh, that's cool. And I don't know if I asked right then or now, but I was like, hey, but I think I'm going to try to propose to Allison. It may have been later that day. I think I'm going to propose to Allison. And my mom was like, oh, well, you can have them. 
<laughs> and I was like, what? Also strange. <laughs> and this is not, this is not, uh, they were real. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't just like jewelry. It was like real yeah. jewelry, real yeah. diamonds. And then uh, I was like, wow, this is really escalating very quickly. Uh, and from there, I remember talking to one of my pastors at the time. And he was like, well, if you think you're serious, let's go talk to my jeweler. <laughs> and we go talk to the jeweler. And the jeweler's like, oh, yeah, I'll make you some rings. Just You just give me the stuff you got and, you know, pay me whenever you can. It's no big deal. Let's get them made. <laughs> and bam, engagement rings, you know. Wow. It's crazy, you know, just thinking about, you know, I, and we're going to get into this, but I think about so many times later in our marriage when things got tough, I was able to draw back from the faithfulness of God that mm. got me into this room, into this marriage you know, it was undeniable that God's mm. hand was in it. Yeah. And, man, that was so necessary mm. for me to hope, be able to hold on to later on. Yeah, wow. But there was a lot of times where I thought I made the worst mistake in my life. Same. <laughs> so I don't know how you really uh, want to get into that. Yeah, I'll, I'll, um, I'll segue into that. You know, I, I think for me, coming from a history of bad relationships and unhealthy relationships and betrayals mm. and just being cheated on. I, I knew that I had a lot of work to do before I got married. And so I started doing that work, but what I did not realize, and the thing about like working on yourself is you always think you're done, you know, yeah. <laughs> like there's always more to go. And for some reason, we always think we've done it all and mm. we're good. And the truth is, I was not good. Like I had a lot of things that I needed um, within me to find healing. And um, I think the thing is, I was getting into our marriage with some baggage. And so were you. I mean, this is so funny. You're like, I came into this thing knowing I had work to do. I came in the opposite. I was like, <laughs> man, God has delivered me from all of this. I'm now perfect and just ready to like be the best husband and father ever. Because for me, that was like such an important thing for me getting saved. Just like, that's been my main goal and mission was to be a perfect husband and be a perfect father because I'd never seen those things. But then, of course, where did I go to learn how to do those things? The movies, the notebook, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, and I came into our marriage thinking I had every Ryan Gosling trick <laughs> to get you to fall in love with me. And I was like this broken, like, you know, almost had like relational PTSD type person who uh, like, don't give me the romance novel. Yeah. Don't give me the, you know, I like, I don't want any of that. Like, <laughs> so I think what's so funny is our expectations when we entered into our marriage were completely different. Oh yeah, completely. And then not only that, but we had odds stacked against us mm. within all of that. Like I, um, for the longest time, you know, because I, came from a history of betrayal in relationships, I thought you were going to cheat on me like every day. Yeah. And so I lived with this um, like almost paralyzing fear that you were going to cheat on me um, to where I could not like live my life, you know, mm. like I was constantly, and you know this very well because you're the one that this happened to, but I was, I was so controlling um trying not to be hurt again, Yeah, you know? So like, yeah. where are you going? Where are you doing? Who are you talking to? You know, all of these things. Um, I just remember the time oh. that I was trying to throw you a surprise birthday party. Yes. And I had got all of the kids from our Dream Center youth group and all your friends downtown <laughs> and had people like trying to get you here secretively and you not figuring out what it is. And I remember all of a sudden it turned so quick. You were like, you are being so sketchy. What is going on? And you, by the time you got I'm there, so you were so mad at me. <laughs> I don't even think it was a good party. <laughs> like it was just. I just, you know, I, I, God, I was so broken. And so, you know, God had to really, um, get with me and give me healing in a lot of mm -hmm. areas. And he used a lot of different 
things to do that. You know, I, I spent a lot of time in therapy. Um, we I've done a lot of like, um, it's called EMDR therapy. Yeah. That's really wild. Um, a very wild uh, therapy, but I can't think of any other type of therapy that is like really like effectively, yeah. you know, reposition some of my and for those that don't know what emdr therapy is it is eye movement desensitization reprocessing therapy man i just sounded like zach bordas i know here. zach but, but what it actually is i didn't know is, what the name was i just <laughs> i was not gonna so say like it. trauma would actually like and you know i'm a neuro nerd trauma I'm will neuro build nerd. a <laughs> knot in your brain that connects uh emotions to it and you know when these emotions get triggered if any past memory, past hurt, past pain gets triggered, you can feel the same exact motions from the original mm. event. And EMDR basically comes through and kind of unravels the spaghetti mm. of your brain. Which makes sense because, you know, as you're doing things in our marriage, like talking to someone else or going somewhere, I don't know where you're going, those were things that maybe happened to me in the past mm -hmm. that ended badly. Yeah. And so for me, I spent a lot of years scared to death that it was ending badly mm -hmm. again. And so what that did to you was it put a lot of pressure on you because it took you a long time to figure out that I wasn't really actually mad at you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, and I didn't help, though, eventually, because I did get you mad at me. I... Uh, <laughs> Like I did, I came in with these unmet, unrealistic expectations of everything is going to be rainbows and butterflies. And I just remember like, you know, even before we got married, we were like, you know, doing what, un, what people do. We're making out and now like, you know, we did wait until we got married, which is awesome to have sex. It's like, which is very probably rare these days, you know, so that's kind of a badge of honor for us. We did good. Uh but I remember as soon as we got married, it was like all of that just oh, stopped. Oh, it was like, you know, for me, I think I I was hit with the reality of, you know, here's another opportunity to get betrayed again, except now I'm locked in by the law. Like mm -hmm. I'm legally binded to you now. And yeah. so it was like fun and we were flirty and all this stuff before we got married. But then once that covenant was made, it was like, I'm stuck. Yeah. Help me. Yeah. I almost had like, I was almost like claustrophobic. And I was so immature. I had no clue what was going on. I was just like. Well, I didn't have words for it either. So it was not like I could just sit down and be like, hey, now I'm going to cry today. And so when <laughs> I cry, what I want you to do is to not take it personally, blah, 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 blah. And that's just, it wasn't the case. So at that point in our marriage, we were very unhealthy. Yeah. I mean, we were, you know yelling at each other all the time and i think for me like one of my my biggest uh i don't know needs or my biggest desires and well probably my biggest insecurity is that i am not capable or have what it takes to be the man that i'm supposed to be because i've never seen that i've never been initiated into being a man so here i am feeling like i'm constantly failing you as a husband mm -hmm which was like my worst fear in the whole yes. world. But it honestly wasn't even us at the table with each other. It was our mm -hmm. past, our, our past. childhoods, our histories relationally, yes. you know. Fighting with each other. And we were looking at it like our present day selves. You know, I just think about that period of time and it was so um, taxing mm. and exhausting. And, um, you know, thank God we didn't have kids early. Oh, yeah. You know, what's so funny is, and we'll get into our infertility journey mm. on another episode. What's so funny is we we always wanted kids and yeah. we we struggled with infertility for eight years and we never prevented from having and kids. And even those eight years we tried to get into foster care, we tried yeah. to get like we were not able to get pregnant or have a child. We for... went through the whole foster care accreditation <laughs> program until we we're having a home visit and I went to go get my rap sheet from the sheriff's office while the home visit lady was at the house with you and the sheriff arrested me. <laughs> right there. And you got arrested, had to bail and I had you to out. Call you. Yeah, it was just like, what is happening? We were just not 
Every door was closed. Yeah. But it's funny because uh, I was so worried about having kids. But looking back, I always say now that I feel like God made us look wiser than we actually are. Mm. Because we, if we <laughs> had kids back then, I don't. I just feel like God has taken care of us because He knows, yeah. you know, what we need more than what we think we want. But yeah, so I would say like many, many years of that, you know, happened and. Um, Man, just from, you know, and me being so weak and insecure, and, you know, I I didn't make, like, horrible mistakes, you know, within our first probably two years of marriage, you know. Here I am just holding down the pressure of all of this. I'm failing at home. I'm failing is what my biggest dream was supposed to be as a husband. And, man, I just crumbled underneath mm. it and really reinforced some of those fears in you, mm. you know. I remember, like, and I'm going to share this because – um, and I hope you're okay with me sharing it, mm. but, uh, you know, we're two years into marriage, you know, finally I'm starting to kind of get back into some ministry and man, I just crumbled under the pressure, ended up, you know, DJing at a wedding, trying to make some extra cash and started, had a glass of wine. And next thing I know, this girl kisses me and it's like, oh, wow. And then here I am now truly have become, you know, my worst fear of mm. being, a bad husband mm -hmm. and you know having to tell you about that mm -hmm. having to go to our pastors and tell them hey I made this horrible mm -hmm. mistake you know and I don't know what to do from here I know you guys just finally gave me a job <laughs> but this is what happened and then it it being the very thing that is triggering to me and so you know I think I think about how We've just triggered each other mm. in our marriage for so many years. Which is the plan of the enemy, for sure, right. to reinforce those lies. Yes. And so I just think God has had to do a major work. You know, not only that in our marriage, but we've had to do a lot of work independently. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I had to get free from this whole got to control you. And if, if you know you, you cannot be controlled. Yeah. You are like so yourself. If I tried to put you in a box, like you would be miserable. I would be miserable. And that's what we did for the longest I was miserable. time. You were miserable. <laughs> you couldn't find yourself. I couldn't find myself. I, you know, I was so worried about like every little thing that you did. Yeah. But I think that happens in so many marriages mm -hmm. is that we end up attracted to somebody because they have something that we don't have or they have something that's attractive or different to us and then once we get together mm. it's like our natural tendency our flesh wants to try to turn that person to become more like us yes and then when you become more like each other you're like you're no fun i don't want to be with you in the well, first place that is so true because i fell in love with you for you know who you are and you're like this crazy you're very different than me and everyone yeah. that i grew up around you never experienced weirdness ever growing never. up no i like went to shows had big holes in my ears i wanted to be weird yeah Punk i was like all day private school girl like don't ever ruffle any feathers just be you know straight I might bring the earrings back nose ring maybe you should but <laughs> i you know i remember all of those things are the things that i loved about you yeah. but then because they were so foreign to me, they quickly became the things that I needed to control. You know who told me a lot of this, that whole philosophy, which I don't think I've ever even told you, was Ronnie from Ruckus. I really? remember being in the skate shop one day. And I don't know, Ronnie's always been almost like a father figure growing up, skate shop owner. being in, He's seen me through the ups and downs, and he was like, don't let her turn you into something else, man, because it was who you were that she originally was attracted to. I mean, that's true. <laughs> but, you know, I had we had to untangle a lot in, within ourselves. And yeah. that doesn't mean that we are doing amazing. You know, we, we still are working on ourselves and, and working on our marriage. But I think we had the biggest breakthrough in our marriage we've ever had when we started going to marriage counseling this past for the last past, year. <laughs> for the third or fourth time. We've seen some yeah, counselors this, over the years. This really, yeah, this was the game changer. Misty, for sure. if you're listening, you're amazing. Grateful. So <laughs> grateful. But yeah, let's talk about that. And just, you know, because my heart in this episode is that I feel like we live in a culture where people are 
ashamed to have marital struggles mm. or relational struggles or counseling, you know, is embarrassing yeah. or, you know, and, and, I, and I get it. I, you know, I've been there and there's nothing more vulnerable to me than sitting on a marriage counselor's couch mm. or in our case, we were each in a chair, yeah. but there's nothing more vulnerable than sitting next to your spouse and having somebody interpret yeah. your disagreement. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like that is like just the most vulnerable, like that is extremely difficult. Yeah. And and I I think for the longest time, because we went to all these other marriage counselors in the past, and I think, you know, we just we're not ready to do that. Like yeah. we, we weren't in the place that we could do that successfully. But I think even if you rewind it a little bit, you know, not so I think we kind of we went fast forward it quickly. Like this we're talking like eight years mm-hmm. of bad marriage. Like eight years of man a wreck. You know, being at odds more than we're not at really odds. Really feeling miserable. Like, I mean, this is and you know, this is where I was talking about for those eight years I had to constantly go back to because you know, just like Adam did in the in the garden. God, this woman you gave me. Mm-hmm. You know, what's up with this woman you gave me? But for eight years, I had to go back to, all right, God put us together, man. God ordained and, man, orchestrated all of our engagement and all this. And, I mean, we got to some really bad places. You know, me leaving, trying to go sleep at my mom's house, which you never let me live down. Uh, to well, I'll never forget, was it Chad Dinkle that said, bro, don't ever leave your wife for your mom's house? <laughs> <laughs> probably so. Probably so. So, like, you know, there was... You know, and part of this, uh, like, you know, honestly, and it was God, but, you know, I think we would have probably quit a long time before if it hadn't been for our hearts for ministry and, you know, knowing that, you know, holding on to hope that God's going to turn things around. And usually a lot of that time I didn't have hope. You know, I remember there was times where I would just like almost, I mean, romanticize how, how is this, how could I ever get out of this thing? Mm. You know, I'm stuck. Because we, we said we're married and we were like, we're not going to say the word divorce. Mm-hmm. We're, you know, we're going to stick through, which I think for both of us in our past, we never learned how to stay yeah. in the situations that we dealt with. And so here we are and we said, we're not going to throw the word divorce out. Mm-hmm. And then now we're forced to stay. And so there we are. And I'd be like, God, if we're going to stay... Maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe she will get in like a car accident or what? something. <laughs> like, I just didn't know. I was like, because I felt like what? I could no longer live in this. Are y'all hearing this? That is like. <laughs> I felt like I could no longer live in this relationship, but I knew that God <laughs> had a hope and a future for me. So I'm just like, how, you know, how is this going to play out, God? I felt like so stuck. But I think what shed a lot of light for us because, you know, the enemy always wants to isolate. So the enemy, I know it's extreme, but I want you guys to understand how, like, dark of a place we've gotten to at different points. You know? I never wanted to die. <laughs> I mean, not, you know, I just didn't know, like, you know. But I remember going to uh, just the importance of community. You know, we always think that we're the only ones struggling with what we're struggling with. Yeah. And then going to a married small group or actually sharing your issues with somebody else. And they're like, oh, yeah, every marriage struggles with that. <laughs> you know, you're every like, marriage oh. has those issues. And you're like, oh, we're not the only one. Which I think that's why this podcast episode is is so important. Because whenever you're in your own home with your own family, your own spouse, like you don't realize how many other homes and other families and other partners are mm-hmm. dealing with the same things yeah. over and over and over. And, you know, that's why I think like marital struggle is um is so uh just like put under the table like Mm. people don't want to talk about it yeah and i I feel like what that does is it isolates people for sure who are 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 shoulder to shoulder with people struggling with the same with the same things yeah and so but they go to church and they you know, they're no cussing idea. each other out on the way to church. Yes. And then raising their hands and holding hands in church. Yes. And, face. you know, this isn't to like, I don't want this podcast to come off like we're glorifying, you know, struggles. That's not it. 
Um, I, I want this podcast to feel like, oh, I can sit across the room from them and hear their story and find bits and pieces that I connect with and, mm-hmm. and find hope that God can help me too. Yeah. You know, cause, cause all of that to say, we were in some really dark places, um, but God had to teach us mm-hmm. and, you know, and, and I think that's, that's, amazing that we stayed because I feel like some some days you know all you can do is stay Mm -hmm. for an a minute you know Mm -hmm. for an hour for you know 30 minutes and then other days you know are better days but I think you know we really relied on God on those dark days yeah and um and and now if you had seen us back then you know we still like our best friends yeah so we still can be, we were out in public probably laughing and mm-hmm. you know giggling and cutting up and truly having a good time and filled with joy but we, we just were never just never wanted to get home we, we just got were, home, yeah we got it real. was just when we were with each other <laughs> <laughs> and nobody else and so you know like we didn't know how to communicate yeah. we didn't know how to communicate hear each one another feelings. yeah like i didn't know how to hear you and then you hear me like we those are just some things that we didn't learn until yeah. we hit this last marriage counseling. Mm-hmm. Um, and so let's talk about marriage counseling really quick because I um, feel like I learned a lot, I almost uh, cha- like changed my life in that yeah. marriage counseling um, because I feel like there are times in marriage, especially with us and maybe anyone in our situation, we didn't know how to communicate, so we needed someone else to sit in the room with us mm-hmm. and decipher what each person yeah, was saying. Mediate. And that was like freeing because she would ask you these questions like, well, how does that make you feel? And you would say it, mm-hmm. and I would be like, oh, my gosh. Had no clue. Had no clue. Yeah. And so I think I learned how to have empathy for you with marriage counseling. Um, you... We're, we were we never did well with being on the same team like we were yeah. like we were not teammates until yeah. like we got it sorted out you know we were against each other and like i said before with my trauma of past relationships you know i thought you were against me mm-hmm. i you were like the enemy to me because i was expecting you to hurt me mm-hmm. to betray me and i was living in that intense fear that that would happen oh, and you so you were 100% my enemy too you know yeah. just thinking here i am Finally have a shot in ministry. Now I screwed it up because, and you know, we blame, as a husband, we blame all of our mistakes on our wife. If our marriage was better, I wouldn't have ever made this mistake. And now I'm kicked back out of ministry again. So are you saying you, you don't take responsibility? For no, me? I am taking responsibility. <laughs> I said that's what we think. Or that's uh, what we say, you know. I'm just messing. And here I am like, man, this girl's ruined my entire ministry dream, oh. you know. And she can't get it together. We can't get it together like you for so many years. And it wasn't like I empathized and saw the pain within you. I just saw the pain you were inflicting on me. Mm, Which is so easy to do just as a human being. Mm -hmm. You know, how common is it to only care about how something affects you? You know, we all do that. And so I think what marriage counseling did for me was it gave me a different perspective um, where I could really hear you. And then we started getting on the same page. Mm-hmm. And um, and we learned a lot of, of tools there that, that really helped yeah. us. Just that, that simple truth of even primary and secondary emotions that we learned about that workshop, you know, of, you know, we usually communicate at secondary emotions of, I am mad, I am angry, but angry and mad isn't even like, typically angry and mad simply come from being hurt, Mm. you know, angry and mad don't come from themselves, they come from pain. Well, and as a guy, you know, you were not very good about your emotions, like you, you haven't been able to articulate them until recently. Yeah, yeah. And as as a woman, I can tell you, all of my emotions, where they come from, how they're positioned, all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And so there was this big disconnect between me and you, and we were just misfiring in every way. Yeah, I got communicating my emotions from 
the notebook, and when that didn't work, I got. <laughs> and I was my, not gonna have that. I was like, <laughs> no, 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 I no was romance. Like trying to like get in your face. I and mean, tell think you these about my story. And think yeah. about my story. No, thank you. And then when the notebook doesn't work, I got my next set of rules from Lil Boosie. I got hurt back in high school, way, way back, and ever since then, it's straight payback. Oh. So you were my enemy, you know. Yeah. And it was like I couldn't let you know how hurt I was mm-hmm. because I had to be the man and. You know, not humble myself and really open up to you, but seem strong and just being so lost. Yeah, I think for me, it was like, you know, that thought of primary and secondary emotions. And I began to see you in a different light. Like Mm. I began to actually see you and Mm. not, you know, what you were projecting Mm. or, you know, the pain. You know, I began to see the pain as pain and not anger or Mm. me. You know, one of my biggest insecurities is not being a good husband or not being enough. So whenever I felt like you were honestly were just hurt and maybe triggered from your past mm-hmm. relationally, or honestly, you were just hurt, I would see it as a reflection of my conduct or my performance. And then you'd get offended. And then I would get offended. <laughs> and then once I got offended, you know, I, I didn't would feel come hurt. Out. You didn't feel hurt. <laughs> I'd be speaking from, you know, I'm mad, I'm upset about this and that, and not really communicating you know, ultimately that I'm just hurt. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm a kid who, at the end of the day, I'm a kid who didn't have a dad growing up, doesn't know what it looks like to be a good husband, and trying my darndest. Darndest. <laughs> <laughs> and you are a, a <laughs> woman who's been hurt multiple times, let down by people. But a lot of times we just see the surface stuff of I'm pissed, I'm angry, I'm mad, you did this, mm-hmm. and we don't see it below the surface That's of good. we're both just honestly kids crying out for each other to be loved yes. and to be cared for because we all want to be, be loved seen. we yeah. all want to be seen we all want to be heard and i think some of those things you know god does he heals but i think some of it you know we just have to continue to see each other and humble ourselves i was about to say you know god had to teach us not only how to be healed individually but how to see one another yeah You know, like we had to, he had to open our eyes to see the pain that Mm -hmm. each other was going through. I remember at the workshop, one of the corniest things, but I even, I sent it to one of my friends is like a punk rock guy, head guy of a hardcore band. And he was having some relational issues. And I was like, dude, you've got to check out this music video. And I think it's casting crowns like broken together, (laughs) but it really is just such a picture of how we're screaming and fighting and yelling. But inside, both of us are just children that are hurt, that are broken. That and we've got to learn loved. how to be broken together, you know? It's like we just want to be loved, but we don't know how to communicate, communicate it. it. Yeah. And God really had to take us on that journey of learning how mm-hmm. to do that the right way. Because um, let's be honest, you know, it's not like that that's just something easy to just know how to do. Yeah. You no, know? it's a practice, you know, yeah. that we learn how. You know, even I get frustrated now, and it's like a practice to see who can get in this confrontation quick enough to understand, okay, somebody's just really hurt. Yes. You know? It's not that we hate each other. It's not that we don't like each other. Yes. Somebody just got what hurt. What was it that um, we learned in the workshop where true, was it like a true apology is being able to see someone yeah. else's pain on their face? A true empathy or true apolo- uh, apology can't be received unless the person who was hurt is able to see their pain on their hurter. Hurt the other is not person's a word. Face. The other person's face. Yeah, because so often I feel like we just throw out the I'm sorry's. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the other person doesn't feel like you meant it or yeah. like it was sincere to you. And so that was very interesting what, how they said how they said that. No, that was huge. And then for me to think, you know, I make a mistake, you're hurt or and upset with me, but I've got to really go down and do some emotional work on my end and really empathize, put myself in your shoes mm. to see exactly how you are hurt, how that triggered, you know, things of your past and how broken that must have made you feel before I can come and really apologize with true emotion Mm. but see before we had the tools we were just so reckless with all of it our emotions were everywhere Mm -hmm. thank god that you know he did what he did to help us yeah but you know here we are today 
Yeah. And while our marriage is not perfect, I'll say it's peaceful. No, for sure. And you really are like, I think that's what was so cool is, you know, God put us together because we could have fun together. Mm -hmm. And that's one of my favorite things about doing this podcast Mm -hmm. is we're like truly meant to be best friends. Mm -hmm. But, and we saw glimpses of it over the years, but we had so many walls up in between yes. us that we were never able to really function and flow yes. in how we were called to. And, you know, I'll say this. I know I mentioned that, you know, I had to heal through a lot of things before we got married, but there were some things that I could only work on yeah. in a marriage. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like marriage brings up so much in us. Mm-hmm. And so you know, while I did a lot of work and you did a lot of work prior to being married, you know, there were only some, there were some things that only marriage could bring out of us. And so I'm just thankful that you stayed Mm -hmm. and you hung on to the roller coaster. I feel like we had to buckle up there for a minute. Um, If you don't quit, you win. Yeah. If you don't quit, you win, you know? Mm. And I think it's, you know, we're always as humans going to look for the path of least resistance. So if divorce is an option, it's always going to be the option, Mm -hmm. you know, because things get hard and we want to get out. We're Mm -hmm. wired to try to survive, Mm -hmm. you know, but I'm grateful for the grace of God that caused me to stick this thing out, staying (laughs) power of God, you know? I mean, I can't imagine having to like start over, do all this over again. (laughs) Please don't ever get in a car wreck. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I need you. You're, You're like my really, best friend. That like you like took this to a weird place. I don't know <laughs> how else to say. But I'm just thankful that um you know that we that we allowed God in. Mm-hmm. Cuz initially it's really just God that intervened. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And so and the thing is God knew that we had uh a journey to go through mm-hmm. in order to get to where we are. And yeah. so you know, I'm just thankful. I'm thankful that God put us together. I'm thankful that He kept us together. I'm thankful for counseling. Amen. God bless it. Yeah. I'm thankful for medication when necessary. God yes. bless it. Which that's another episode. I feel like I feel like we have so much drama. <laughs> we just need to talk about it all. But you know, both of us have relied on medication at mm-hmm. different times um, to get us through different seasons, and so. Um, yeah, I wouldn't trade our journey for the world. I feel like I've learned a lot about yeah. myself, about how to love, about y- you. I feel like I've just grown um, to know God more. And I feel like we've gotten to know each other so much more in a deeper way than a lot of people end up doing in their marriage to a lot later on, you know, because we comb over a lot of hurts and pains and things. But ours, you know, God brought them all up at the very beginning, you know, <laughs> marriage is not to make you happy, it's to make you holy. And he <laughs> completely turned the heat up on that very quick, mm. you know, and got to really get us to a place of where we're able to truly just love each other freely and yeah. you know, be each other, be ourselves. and Yeah. And if I could just say, you know, one thing or a couple of things in closing, you know, one thing I've learned in this is like, if you're struggling, get help. Yeah, tell somebody. Tell somebody. Not everybody. Not somebody. everybody. Don't tell everybody. Gosh, <laughs> just tell somebody that can handle the information and knows what to do. But and get somebody help. that's married. Somebody, somebody that's, that's married. married yeah, that don't, understands. don't go to a person of the opposite sex and do all that whole yeah. thing. That's a mess. Don't get messy. But get help. You yeah. know, there. it's like don't stay... Um, where you're at for long, yeah. like, like get help, get, get the help that you need. Mm-hmm. And you know, that's, that's just been what we've done. Yeah. Well, thank you for listening to this podcast. We hope that you subscribe, like, share it. We don't even know what the share words with somebody, are. Encourage somebody. Share it with somebody. You know? Maybe you know somebody that's struggling in their marriage or struggling with relationships Um, and maybe could use some encouragement today, uh, go ahead and share it. And, uh, you know, like we always say on this podcast, life can be tough, but God is still so good.